Hello and welcome uh, everyone to this special session on uh, Parameterized Complexity 301 workshop. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Mike Fellows, who is going to be speaking at this session. Uh, Mike needs no introduction. Um, as many of you know, he's one of the founders of the area of parameterized complexity, which is what this whole workshop is about. So um, along with uh, Rod Downey, uh, Mike had worked out various notions of parameterized complexity, this idea of fixed parameter tractability, the complexity classes, the relationship between them, complete classes for each one of them, and so on and so forth over a period of several papers in late 80s, early 90s. And um, in addition to demonstrate the power of parameterized complexity, Mike had actually worked in multiple different areas. Uh, his early papers were in you know, databases, uh, scheduling, uh, automata theory, logic, uh, bioinformatics, and so on and so forth. And for his work in uh, parameterized complexity and in various other graph classes, he has won a number of awards, but I am not going to uh, list them uh, here because you can find them from his website. But I'll tell you a couple of things which you may not find it in the website. <laughs> um, so, you know, apart from um, writing on papers in various areas, Mike also traveled all over the world in the early years of parameterized complexity, you know, Australia, New Zealand, India, uh, China, Hong Kong, many countries in Europe, uh, Canada, US, gave talks and in fact, Mike and I organized at least three meetings in parameterized complexity uh, around the early time. Two in uh, India, one the in- The first one was in India. First one was in India, and uh, first two were in India, I think, and then one was in uh, Canada. First two, yeah. Right. And, and Mike, uh, you know, has gone and encouraged young researchers in all these countries and helped establish research groups in all these countries. So if, for example, uh, uh, parameterized complexity is having a great field day now, and you know IMSC is one of the strong groups. Uh, it was all because of the seed sown by uh, Mike at that time. In uh, addition, Mike uh, is also has a you know global perspective on science. He, he likes to talk to young researchers. He has a lot of friends in our institute, uh, of, among uh, mathematicians and physicists. And uh, Mike and friend also have a lot of friends uh, with the auto drivers, the cooks, the, the, the flower ladies, the sweepers, and, and so on and so forth. So Mike has a uh, generous um, heart that he shares his ideas, shares a lot of things with many people. Mike is also well known for his work on computer science unplugged book, which has been picked up at, uh, in various languages which explains uh, to school children uh, computer science you know, without computers. So without uh, any more further delay, I leave it, I will give it to Mike, who's going to talk about the early days of parameterized complexity. Over to Mike. Okay, thanks for the opportunity to, to, to tell, a, do a bit of storytelling about how parameterized complexity got started. This is in some sense, for that reason, an oral history. And these are always kind of interesting. It's an interesting genre. And I, I will mention, recycle some stories that I heard at, uh, of a talk by Richard Carr, where he talked about the early history of, of P versus MP and so forth. Uh, it's a, so that there'll be some stories and I'll also go through some of the technical points that came up as the field developed. Um, so I was lucky as a graduate student, uh, and this was a million years ago, I'm realizing some people in the audience probably weren't even born yet. Uh, in 1983 or so, uh, yeah, as a graduate student, I was fortunate to be exposed to the what was happening or beginning to happen in the area of graph miners and the work of Robertson and Seymour, which to the combinatorics and community was absolutely sensational. And I think we must all admit in retrospect and even looking into the future that this was, this was a huge development. 
Um, and so I was, I was, uh, I knew through um, Janos Komlos, who was one of the hung Hungarians that was at the University of California, San Diego, where I was a PhD student, that Robertson and Seymour had proved two huge theorems. And these were in many ways, the instigation to parameterize complexity. So I'll, I'll remind what these two theorems are. Robertson and Seymour proved two theorems. Number one, they proved that um, finite graphs are well quasi-ordered So I'll explain what that means by the minor order. And Robertson Seymour number two, that if you have input, H and G, and the question is H a minor or G, that this is order of N cubed, where N is the input size of G and A, it's total input size for every fixed. H. Okay, so this is really where eventually this is where this was the instigation to the definition of fixed parameter tractability, the central notion in parameter complexity. But I would kind of like to come at the subject um, from a different angle since this is a Christmas holiday. A few years ago, uh, at a Christmas gathering, after I received something like a knighthood, an Australian knighthood for parameterized complexity primarily. My cousin said, why did you get this award? And you, I had to give him the two minute version, which um, in many ways encapsulates where what we're trying to do with parameterized complexity. And this has to refer to the end history of theoretical computer science, which is the what happened in the beginning. Well, in the beginning, there was programming and recycling a story from Richard Karp and his account, his oral history of the origins of NP completeness. Before NP completeness, there really wasn't much theory. <laughs> and NP, he talked about being employed at, uh, by some laboratory and they, he, had, he knew how to program. So he wrote a program for the traveling salesman program problem and, and it's a nice, neat package of code, gave it an input, turned it on. He was talking about a summer internship as a student and nothing happened. Okay, so I have to explain to my cousins the context of what is algorithms and complexity. And you can do this when you're sitting next to somebody on an airplane, that in the, in the my uh, cousin is a librarian at the University of California, San Diego, and her husband is the chief librarian at the library at Scripps Oceanography at the University of California, San Diego. So they, they are somewhat aware of science and, and have been to college and so forth. And you say, well, I do, we, the prizes for algorithms and complexity. And in the olden days, there wasn't much. And then came NP completeness. And NP completeness said, well, we model everything in terms of decision algorithms. We'll have a notion of legal input and we'll have a question. And we'll look at when we have legal input of size n, what's, how much time as a function of n does it take to be sure of answering the question correctly in the worst case, no matter what the legal input of size n is. And what happened with NP completeness is that in came the notion of polynomial time, 
as the good. And in came polynomial time reductions and the gigantic discoveries that almost all the problems you're really concerned with in engineering and everywhere else are NP complete. That's the context into which eventually parameterized complexity emerge. And so I'm explaining to my cousins, what is it that parameterized complexity brings to the table? And it's just in that usual picture that since almost everything turns out to be require exponential time, we try to find a parameter which can be all kinds of stuff, a word, a vector, and can find the explosion, the exponential explosion to the parameter while the overall input size is polynomial and in. Now, in historical terms, it's worth remembering that when polynomial time was proposed as the central notion of the good in classical complexity, in around 1970, 71, 72, it was controversial. It was controversial with Turing Award winner, Bob Targin. He said, look, if C is bigger than three, forget about it. It will not be useful. When Bob talks about the origins of computational complexity, he mentions that and he mentions that it's a, he mentioned in a talk that I heard that it, Interestingly, serious polynomial time, C can be three. There are very few serious polynomial time algorithms where C is anything bigger than three. Usually in cube, folklore is that you can, you can do it in N squared. Actually, you could probably do N log N but you shouldn't because it's too complicated. You end up with very complicated data structures or maybe even linear time as in Bob Targin's Turing Award winning algorithm for planarity testing. So when we think about the history of parameterized complexity, we need to think about the broad sweep of theoretical computer science, which began in the classical framework, which is still dominant with the notion of one dimensional measurement, legal input size, worst case asymptotic, polynomial time is the notion of the good. The tragedy in some sense, the beauty and tragedy of that initial framework of theoretical computer science is that almost everything turns out to be NP complete. So, parameterized complexity says, well, there are often relevant secondary aspects that, to which we can confine the seemingly inevitable combinatorial explosion. Now I'll tell another bit of oral history. Parameterized complexity first made practical inroads in computational biology and one of my PhD students in 1993, uh, some of us were alive by then. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that must be half the audience were born after 93. But anyway, um, we went over to the University of Washington and there was Joe Felsenstein, famous in biology, a member of the National Academy of Sciences. He was famous for a package called Phylob for computing phylogenies. And I had never met him before. And so, so he said, well, who are you? Where, what do you do? Where, where do you work? I said, well, at the University of Victoria, just across from Seattle. And I do algorithms and complexity. And Joe said, I'm not very happy with you people. About 10 years ago, some of you came around and said, we've heard you have some really cool problems. And they proved their NP complete and then they went away. And I said, well, Joe, <laughs> Just a minute, uh, we're, we're trying to do something about this. And you know, like for example, you're, you're working on a phylogenetics problem 
for viruses. The sequences are big. The total number of bits you need to describe the input for a phylogeny problem about 10 variants of a virus genome, something of current relevance perhaps, and you have 20 different, 20 different variants um, and you're trying to work out an evolutionary tree, if we can confine the exponential explosion to that secondary measurement, the number of variants, like two to the 20 times n squared over the overall input size, something like that, wouldn't that be good? And Joe said, yes, two to the 20 being about a million and a million times n squared, yes, that's fine. And so, and Joe, we have a, an algorithm of that sort for Steiner and hypercubes, which is relevant to this sort of thing. He says, how does it work? And um, then I just described how the FP, what we would now call an FPT algorithm for Steiner and hypercubes, a parameter being the number of leaves, which is what you expect in an evolutionary tree, one leaf for each of the variants. And again, he got angry. He said, that's what I do. <laughs> okay, good. That's, that's good to know. Um, and that's a good start for a theory to be doing stuff that practical people are already doing or to be investigating in that, in that kind of a direction. So that's one of my favorite anecdotes from the early days of the FPT. So uh, getting back to some of the early history and the impact of, uh, oh, and uh, just to finish up with my cousins, when I said, so the, what we're trying to do in parameterized complexity is with these relevant secondary measurements, such as the number of species in an evolutionary tree, and might be the DNA sequence data, huge. We're trying to get this to happen where maybe this is two to the K, we can afford that. And they said, well, that, that sounds quite reasonable. Mm -hmm. They're librarians, so they don't have very many papers at Box and Stella. Um, so in those uh, around 83, Robertson and Seymour announced these two amazing theorems. And what you could say in using modern terminology is that we could say, I guess I, this is visible up here, minor testing. The input is H and G. The parameter is H. And the question is, is H a minor of G? Well, this is, uh, this is well, what do we say these days? We use O star. Um, n cubed FPT. So some function of H times n cubed. I'm telling the story of where this theory of parameterized complexity came from. It is a graduate student on hearing this and hearing what this means. This is just a magnificent generalization of Kuratowski's theorem, characterized planarity in terms of two obstructions. Robertson Seymour too is saying, if you, um, uh, sorry, Seymour one is saying, if you have a property of graphs which is closed under minors, such as planarity, a mi and I suppose most of the audience knows what a minor is, and H is a minor of G, if you can get to H from G by a series of operations of contracting an edge or deleting an edge or deleting a vertex. If we have a property that's minor closed, such as planarity, then there, the extrinsic property of being planar drawable is characterized by intrinsic structural 
a finite list of intrinsic structural criteria that as Kuratowski tells us, G does not have K33 as a minor and it does not have K5 as a minor. And my impression as a graduate student was that, wow, this has got to be a big deal. This has to be a huge engine for polynomial time. And so shortly after finishing the PhD in eight, that started earlier in 85, thinking about what can you do with this powerful machinery? Now, you could do a lot of amazing things, among which, um, for example, if you say, well, if I have the input is a graph and I'll, I guess I'll need a new, Let's just, you could make these up all day long if you wanted to. All right, the input is G and K. And we'll use some, I apologize for shifting back and forth in time a little bit. All right, in giving this history. I'm shifting into the future where we have this usual notation for a parameterized problem. We have some input. We identify part of the input as the parameter. N is the overall input size, everything. And we have some question. So can we embed G in three space so that at most K disjoint cycles, are non trivially. Not Well, I'm assuming maybe a little bit of familiarity with not theory. This is a this is a non-trivial knot. That means it's there's no way you can manipulate this and come up with this. Now, if I have a planar graph, I just put it in flat and none of the cycles are not in, in my model in my three space embedding of G. And I'm asking whether I can stick G into a model of G in three space so that there aren't K vertex disjoint cycles, each of which considered alone is non-trivially knotted. Now think about it. If I can do that with G, and I want to contract an edge, it's not going to create any knots that weren't there. If I'm contracting the edge of the embedding I had for G, when I go to H below G in the minor order by the operation of an edge contraction. If I delete vertices, I'll just use the same embedding. It's not going to create any new knots. Same with deleting an edge. So this is the yes instances are closed under minors. So by Robertson Seymour number one, there's a Kuratowski theorem characterizing this property. There's a finite list of obstructions, just like there are two obstructions, K33 and K5 for planarity. There's a finite list of obstructions for this property. Testing each of these obstructions is order n cubed, where n is the number of vertices of g. So this is FPT, or is it? That depends on your definition. In the beginning, the motivation of fixed parameter tractability 
really had two motivations. Number one, whatever it is, it should allow for this amazing machinery to give us FPT. And secondly, we want to deal with we want to deal with this where are we, this, the tragic situation that everything in sight is NP complete. We want the fruits of graph minor theory to give us what we call FPT. It instigated the definition, inspired the whole project, and we want to serve applications. And this was what Rod and I thought about when we formulated our definitions. So going back to the ancient, the old history a bit, in the classical, we call it, we began calling it the classical setting. Worst case, asymptotic, one dimensional, which in many ways grew from recursion theory. And in fact, Steve Cook was trained as a recursion theory. It was recursion theory that in some sense gave birth to the first frameworks of theoretical computer science, which came into a vacuum. There was no substantial theoretical computer science. I remember I had a, this is anecdotal again, I had a dean at, at one of the universities, a respectable university where I work. We were campaigning for a PhD in computer science and, and the dean said, I just don't understand why you need to give out a PhD in secretarial science. Well, with a master's degree in word processing or something, what? This was in the early 90s. So what happened was as computer science was still a new field, still trying to become established, still establishing PhD programs, this was at a lesser university, but still a major one. Um, and it, so it was just it, another anecdote which I'm recycling was I heard at a deck stool from an old timers about- uh, Mike, was like can I interrupt? When, um, Mike, uh, Mike, one question. So Jam here, I want to ask a question before you move away from Nautilus embeddings. Uh, it's Jam. Hi, Jam. Just, just a question, yeah. So uh, you were using the fact that they're closed under minors, right? I mean, just now. But uh, you were actually doing work on embeddings without knots even before, right? What kind of approaches were there before the robertson Seymour theorem? Um, what kind of things were there before robertson Seymour that had to do with knots in your studies about knots? Um, it has it. Tell them that you don't want to get too dis. That's a, there, there. I could send you an email about that. Okay. There, there was a turned out in many cases that there, when we began to think about these kinds of things, we discovered that there was earlier some earlier literature. It's kind of like when we began thinking about FPT. Another example is that Felsenstein was doing FPT essentially. And there was an earlier paper about Steiner FPT. There were earlier FPT algorithms. And in the case of knots, there was some work attempting to identify obstructions for knotlessness, a series of papers by topologists that we discovered later. But this particular parameterized version with K disjoint cycles, it, there was nothing about that. Okay. Thanks. Okay. It's an example of a of a of a problem that you could you can easily come up with them. 
where graph miners applies because the S instances are closed under miners. Okay, so um, maybe I should speed up a little bit. And we get to the parameterized framework. And you know, classical, you have the input and you have a question. You know, in parameterized setting, we have the input. Now, what is the input to a parameterized problem? You know, so when we we're trying to set this up, the Downey Fellows definition said the input is x and y. And for notational purposes, we'll say, well, the total length of the input, that's n. So we're keeping that from the classical setting the total number of bits of the input. Uh, we have a declaration of the parameter. In this case, we'll say y. And the length of y, we'll say is k. And again, we have a question about the input to be answered. This might not be the definition that you have seen for a parameterized problem. This was the first definition. And the reason for it was because Rod and I considered the possibility that what the parameter might be a bunch of stuff. So we'll just make it another word. So in other words, this x, y is, is contained in Cartesian product of some alphabet. And a lot of the, I just want to make a comment that a lot of the recent vigor of the uh, parameterized complexity comes from considering parameters which are an aggregate of, of various secondary measurements. Okay, but um, now I want to get back to uh, Robertson Seymour for a second. When you when you see a definition of, of oh well, let's put it up here. Central definition is fixed parameter tractability. And this is the Downey Fellows definition. It's solvability in time. Function of K times the overall M to a constant, as in the You might have seen a definition where where it says, and f of k is recursive. But no, we didn't do that. And there's a reason why we didn't do that. It's because the robertson seymour theorems are so powerful that you, well, there's two reasons for keep, that we left the, we just said f of k, function of k times sentence end of the constant. Because you see, this is such a powerful theorem that it does not guarantee that the number of obstructions is computable. That is a result from an area of logic called proof theory. And the thing is, this theorem is associated with functions which grow faster than anything having to do with computable functions. So if you want to use this as a classification tool, which it is very powerful, you don't immediately know that, that what's hiding in this big O is, is a computable function of K. So, so if, you, if you insist in your definition of FPT, that f of k is recursive, you're losing the origins of the field in instigation in well quasi ordering, which remains a very powerful means of proving FPT results. For our example, um, you might say, well, graph bandwidth 
bandwidth is without drawing a picture, it's about ordering the vertices so that no edge stretches more than more than k. Okay, how about the following problem? The input is a graph G, the parameter is k, the uh, k and r. And I want to know if if um, r is the uh, vertex cover number of the graph, can I can I find a layout where the bandwidth is at most k for parameter k and r? Well, this is because graphs of bounded vertex cover number are well quasi ordered by induced subgraphs and have FPT order tests. Immediately, this is FPT. But recursive f of k, hmm. You have to do more work. And in general, if you're using well-quasi ordering, you don't know. You, it's extremely non-trivial. And another thing about having f of k be recursive, you try to write, you try to make a theory that's useful to applied people, and they most people, as Rod said wouldn't know a non-recursive function if it hit them in the head. You want to make it easy to read. You what? You want the biologist to have to run off to Wikipedia to find out what a recursive function is. I, why do that? Why make the admission price high? So that, that was our motivation for in this history of where the definitions were coming. We were concerned with two things, that the admission price be low and that the Robertson Seymour stuff be useful for FPT classification. Okay. Um, now, so this was the first era that we had. Uh, I've described two different eras. There was before theory, NP completeness came into the scene. Oh, and I wanted to say uh, another bit of oral history at this interesting Dagstrel meeting, guys were describing, this is the old guys, <laughs> were describing the impact of the theory of NP completeness on the theory community in those days. When it first came out, it was sensational. Everybody was doing NP completeness. It, things were moving so fast that Dave Johnson started a column in the Journal of Algorithms, a monthly column to keep up with the incredible pace of discoveries about NP hardness, which added up in the, after a while to a, a picture of the, well, just about everything's NP complete. But it was sensational. It moved, the theory moved into a vacuum. Then not that many years later, here you have Robertson and Seymour with non-constructive methods of proving polynomial time complexity. Uh, this was essentially ignored by Fox and Stock and Soda for about five years. It sounded interesting. A lot of the early work was about, was about well quasi ordering it. We wrote one paper um, in 86 uh, on non-constructive proofs of polynomial time. What we, had, what we did was we looked at a problem in, in a VLSI layout, which is usually about matrices of zeros and ones. And, um, and we showed that, what's that? Your hands are not being seen oh. on the screen. Okay, yeah. We showed that, um, Fran's giving me some coaching over here. Um, we showed that for every fixed K of this layout width, several years later proved equivalent to path width, but it was not initially about graphs. It was about matrices that you could consider this problem in terms of graphs and that it was, if you mapped it over to graph, it was minor closed, and there you go. N cubed for every fixed K. This was a really nice result about a problem in VLSI layout. So we wrote a paper called Non-Constructive Advances in Polynomial Time. It was accepted in 48 hours. It, 
Langston faxed it in to information processing letters. In 48 hours, the chief editor faxed it back, said, your paper's been accepted. I refereed it myself. It's sensational. It'll be in the next issue. Nevertheless, this was rejected from stock, rejected from Fox. And Fox and stock rejected everything having to do with graph miners for about five years. But this is sort of normal for the way that science chugs along. They, when, when really new stuff comes along, the reaction is often mixed. We, we now take it for granted about plate tectonics, which was first proposed in 1910 and documented and ridiculed by professors of geology until the mid 70s. Um, and there's plenty of examples of, of, of that's how science progresses. So one of the things I must report about the early days of parameterized complexity, it was controversial. It had, it was inspired by graph miners. Um, it, the first talks about, about parameterized complexity where you put up the central definition FPT, well, imagine giving a talk about your theory having, Rod and I were developing a theory where this was the good, and so we needed methods for proving the good for a parameterized problem. We needed technology to prove that the good's probably not available, something analogous to MP hardness, which we got from the W hierarchy. It doesn't matter whether you define it this way, if you put a plus, but in these early talks, maybe this is even better because it shows that all of the exponential costs are being conf cleanly confined to the secondary measurements and structure of your input. And in real applications, there is an abundance of secondary structure and restrictions concerning realistic inputs. But imagine giving a talk about this new idea, and this happened several times, where someone extremely prominent is shouting from the back of the room, your definitions are all wrong, Mike. They're pathological. What was the pathology? The pathology was in taking the holy polynomial and marrying it to an uncontrolled exponential. So there was quite a bit of controversy that went on for more than 10 years about this. All right, um, but we launched the theory and, and we, we've got uh, worked out that we worked out the notion of FPT reductions and worked out W hardness as a way of showing that FPT is probably not available. And Rod and I, in the early days, this would have been around 2001, 2002, we were so excited. We, we had three or four problems that were known to be W hard. And we had a handful of problems that were FPT and we had some technology for FPT. We didn't really know if, if things would continue to develop or not. But around 1994, um, we realized that, that in some sense, our, our efforts to build a theory about confining the exponential costs of NP hard problems, which is almost everything, to secondary measurements was in fact, had in fact been somewhat successful. We had, we called it the three luckies. Then those were that first of all, the theory turned out to be enormously doable. Now there, in the, in the museum of failed theories, there's all kinds of theories that have been proposed in theoretical computer science. They didn't go anywhere because nobody could do them on an average Thursday. So it was doable. Uh, it turned out that there were very few 
natural degrees, that is to say equivalence classes under FPT reductions of natural problems. Almost everything is either FPT or hard for W1 or hard for a smaller group complete for another class. One of the miracles and beauties of NP-completeness is that all these thousands of problems are all precisely equivalent under polynomial time reductions. It's just like looking at different ways of looking at the same problem, a single degree. Something like that happened in parameterized complexity. It became clear around mid nineties that this was happening, that it was doable, that there were a surprising amount of natural order of very few degrees captured most of the parameterized complexity phenomena of natural problems. And that it was in no trivial way related to classical complexity. Um, and then the third era began where we figured out various ways in which you could use the parameter to investigate interesting directions. What what shall the parameter be? Around 1995, Valerie King came into my office in Victoria and said, can the parameter be anything? And I said, yes, because we've set things up with the parameter is some word. Yes, it can be anything legally. She said, can it be one over epsilon, where epsilon measures the goodness of approximation so that a PTAS is essentially a parameterized result? We never thought of that. Yes. And then the whole development began to look at approximation in terms of K being one over epsilon, where epsilon Epsilon governs the goodness of approximation. And where classical PTAS results, such as in Gary and Johnson, are XP results. And now I'll mention in this, this third era, which is still underway, some other ways of using parameterization that emerged. Um, at some point we were thinking about local search where you, you if you, uh, one of the local search heuristics for the traveling salesman problem is called K change, where you delete K edges of your current tour and reconnect it in all possible ways, take the best one. K change is if you try all possible ways of knocking out K edges, well, that's N to the K. And then you see trial ways of reconnecting and see if any of them's better. It's, it's an XP algorithm. No one had really thought about that maybe you could get an FPT algorithm for the K change neighborhood in local search. Well, that's an interest. That turned out to be an interesting way of using this parameter business. Another one, um, looking for my list. There's one above the list there. Uh, right. Another one that turned up after a while was you have you have a input X on network. Maybe you have a dominating set, and your network changes a little bit. Can you change your solution a little bit so that it's still a solution? If you ask for optimality, you end up with hardness. But if it just your input just changed a little bit. And you, you, so your old solution doesn't work anymore and you change the solution a little bit. If you do this for dominating set where the change in the network has to do with edges dropping in and out and the 
change in solution means changing the vertices in the dominating set. Well, this turns out to be FPT. So this became a paradigm of parameterization that was termed parameterized dynamic problems. Starting with the concrete example of dominating set. Then other, other things arose. Well, one that's worth mentioning because it deserves further, further development is called, well, we've been calling, you have to call it something. We've been calling it K-ultrafinitism. An example is heat sensitive scheduling, which it was in, it's NP hard, but it's a problem modeled with real numbers that model the heat level of the jobs to be scheduled and you don't wanna burn up your CPU. But how do you know what, your, what the heat level of the job is? You don't know exactly. What if you parameterize on the number of heat levels? Well, then it turns out to be FPT. So that got us thinking about all these problems which are modeled with real numbers. Whereas in the real world, infinite precision asymptotic complexity with real numbers, if that's in your problem legislation, well, no wonder it's NP hard or worse because the proofs of hardness will exploit this infinite precision but if you say realistically, there's not, we don't really know infinite precision about our inputs and you ultra finitistically just say, well, there's only K ranges that don't classify everything as cool, pretty cool, kind of warm, a bit warm, heat levels. Well, then all kinds of problems which are classically modeled with real numbers that are NP hard, for example, Nash equilibria, become FPT, appropriately parameterized by ultrafinitizing the real numbers. That's interesting and potentially useful. Then, um, oh, just picking things at random, what else? What else turned up? You know, we, we started looking at, I don't know how to wave my hands around, a table. The rows of the table are various measurements. So you have dominating set number of colors, just do graph problems, bandwidth, vertex cover. And the vertical columns are the same. And you want to play every measurement against every other measurement. So you end up looking at the table and saying, well, I wonder what is the parameterized complexity parameterized by vertex cover number of bandwidth? Turns out it's FPT. What about graph coloring parameterized by bandwidth? What about anything versus anything else? A lot of that's unexplored. That's the parameter ecology program where you, you just play one parameter against another, and declare one or more things to be the parameter of interest for your parameterized complexity, complexity analysis. Um, I should, you want me to put the camera on the list? What's that? Put the camera on the list. Oh no. <laughs> no, so uh, there there are more stories, but Fran tells me I've I guess I talk about a couple more and then Okay, she's coaching me to we, we recently uh, okay, so here's another one that turned up. You, you know, there's lots of oh, NP hard problems for which there are greedy heuristics. Well, um you make a choice, maybe out of the end possibilities at each step, and 
and then you end up somewhere, maybe you get stuck. Maybe if you backed up K steps, it's kind of like a local search. Maybe you could find your way through that end of the K non-determinism, the last K steps of the non-deterministic greedy heuristic in an FPT way and get a little further. Turbocharge greedy. It's a, different, it's a different way of using the parameterization. Another one that turned up recently, we thought, you know, talking to these biologists, uh, if, you, if you come up with a multiple sequence alignment, which is one of their key problems, they'll look at it. If you come up with more than one solution, they'll, they'll look at these things and say, not that one. I forgot that there, I happen to know something more about these sequences. I prefer this other alignment for these other reasons, which are not in the legislation that you're working with for the single solution that's modeled your classical or even your amateurized problem. You're, this is asking in many cases, is there a single solution that meets a quality bound? But in many, many applied settings, people don't want one solution. They want a variety of solutions, but they don't want them all. They want a small number of high quality solutions, which are diverse. It turns out that you can, you can, and our first result on this was with vertex cover. You could say, well, we'll have K, the size of the vertex cover measure the quality. We want our solutions and we want to meet a diversity measure of D and we'll parameterize on K, R, and D. Turns out to be FPT for several different natural diversity metrics, D. But the point is that in many real applications, they don't want one solution and parameterization allows you a convenient way to add, add that you want a small number of high quality solutions. So there is another way of using parameterization to get at what practical people really care about. Which one are you looking at? Oh, another another one that uh, another thing that happened along the way. Um, I guess I've run out of time, but just mention this quickly. In the beginning, we thought, well, maybe we can deal with a parameter, which is one value K. But then there was work, particularly by Faisal Abukazim, where he took a, a biologically motivated problem and said, well, I know the clusters have this many. He ended up with a vector parameterization with KRSWZ. And at first, in the olden days, we would have run away. We would have said, ah, what are we going to do? They showed that it actually you could do the mathematics. And when the FPT was implemented, it performed really well because this vector parameterization allowed for everything you happen to know about typical solutions to be included in the mathematical legislation of the parameterized problem. The doability of vector parameterizations is potentially a very big deal. Mike? Uh, and, okay, I guess I've run out of time. <laughs> sorry to interrupt. And I had to say thank you for the chance to tell a few of the stories of how the field began. Um, thank you very much, Mike, for this uh, excellent um, story of about the history of parameterized complexity. I'm sure there will be people wanting to ask you questions. Um, you have some time uh, to be around? Oh, I, have, I have time. Sure. Okay. So uh, there is a message in the chat uh, by Rupai Q. You want, do you want to unmute and ask? Um, uh, hi, Mike. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, yeah, I have a question about something 
uh, instead theory, which can be defined by uh, without any parameters. Uh, yeah, maybe that's uh, one example that uh, parameter cannot help. I'm sorry. So is, it is. I didn't quite get the question. Since there is a um, countable model of Gidel Bernay set theory, which has a class forcing extension to a pointwise definable model. Basically, she says there is there are no parameters in this model, is what I understand. Are there is can I rephrase it as are there natural problems? Oh, there I, I think this is not a natural problem. It's something like in set theory related to uh, logic and uh, definable language. So they can define this set uh, without this any parameter. Uh, so that's very weird uh, for me. So, yeah. No, that's a different use of the word parameter. Uh, okay. Um, it's it, it, many parts of mathematics different words in different mathematical contexts are used differently. There's only so many English words to go around and they, they do get used in different ways in different mathematical contexts. That's a different use of the word parameter. Oh, all right, thank you. Um, maybe I'll tell one more anecdote about that though. One of my favorite anecdotes is that um, Rod Downey said, to, that he had talked to Anil Narod and described our program. And an, Anil stared at the ceiling, you know, you want to confine the exponential explosion of the parameters. Of course, what else is there to do? You guys will be famous someday, send whatever you write to, to me and I'll put it in my journal. Um, Narod being a very famous logician. Um, and then later, well, he said, you know, you shouldn't have called it parameterized complexity. You should have called it multivariate because then people would understand more easily what you're on about. It's just multivariate. You're doing more than just measuring the number of bits of illegal input. You're making other measurements. So you should have called it multivariate. And it's a pretty good point. We started to adopt that to some extent. Another question? Oh, okay, thank you very much. Um, are there other questions or comments? There doesn't seem to be any. Um, so really, thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure listening to you again, even though some of it I've heard before, but it's, there's always something new. And um, thanks again for spending time with us. You're welcome. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Mm -hmm.